Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Bob Sibahar. Bob is a sports dietitian who has served as a sports dietitian for the U.S. Olympic Committee. He focuses on creating metabolic efficiency by focusing on real whole foods. Bob, it's great to have you on the show. Well, thanks, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be on here. Well, Bob, tell me a little bit about what metabolic efficiency is and what you mean by that. Yeah, it's, it's quite a, an interesting topic. You know, there's a lot of uh, spin-offs on it, and some people don't fully understand the topic in general, but it's 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 actually pretty basic science. Metabolic efficiency in, in, in coach speak or sport dietitian speak, um, and even athlete speak is really just using the nutrients that we have stored in our bodies more efficiently, right? So we have fat and carbohydrates stored in our body. Fat completely predominates our energy stores versus carbohydrate stores are very low. Even in, in high carbohydrate follower diets, they're still pretty low in terms of how many calories we store. So it's really metabolic efficiency is looking at that, that association of can we mobilize and use more fat as energy um, throughout a series of intensities, and that's one thing I'll talk about here, throughout a series of, in- of exercise intensity, and at the same time that we do that, can we actually preserve our carbohydrate stores, very, very limited carbohydrate stores, until they're really needed? Uh, so that's kind of the, the you know, the, the 30,000-foot view of what metabolic efficiency is. It, it's grounded in scientific research. Um, and, you know, the, the new things that are coming out with metabolic efficiency really stem around nutrition. Because, you know, we've known for, for decades that aerobic exercise improves the mitochondrial capacity to burn fat. So we can train our bodies to burn fat by doing low slung aerobic um, work and runs and cycling and whatever. But a lot of athletes don't focus on that in the majority of their training because obviously there are some performance goals too. So I've been, uh, I've been showing some really interesting results as I do some metabolic efficiency testing to quantify the, the data that, you know, I'm giving my athlete qualitatively. So it's, it's, it's been very fascinating just to see how different athletes respond and, and what intensities they can actually use fat. Um, you know, it's not the, not the lower intensity anymore. You know, I've shown that a lot of athletes can, can train and compete at a pretty high intensity and utilize a lot of their fat reserves. Interesting. So give me a little bit of background about yourself. How, what, at what point did you get into this? I know you're, you're an endurance athlete yourself. Uh, tell the listeners a little yep. bit about when you started doing this and, you know, kind of what piqued your interest in, in doing this in the first place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is um, this is my 13th year, official year, practicing as an, as an official registered dietitian, sport dietitian. Um, I've been coached for 20 years now, coaching a lot of endurance athletes. I actually grew up as a team sport athlete, playing soccer and basketball and pretty competitive level. And I actually didn't do my first endurance race, my first triathlon, until I was a sophomore in, in college in my undergraduate um, you know, off of a dare. So I wasn't really introduced to endurance sports until, you know, farther in my in my lifetime and just became hooked. And it was just such a, like most endurance athletes, just absolutely loved it. And, you know, started doing sprint races, 5K, 10Ks, Olympic distance triathlons. Then I started moving up in my distances and I noticed that I had severe stomach issues and, and cramping, bloating, you know, obviously the porta potty stops during the longer distance races. And I'm just thinking mm-hmm. to myself, you know, back then, why, why is it, is this the norm? You know, I had never experienced <laughs> that as a soccer player. I'm like, you know, I had no idea what GI distress was. Mm-hmm. So I started, you know, I started really looking into that a little bit more. And, you know, back in those days, you know, I, I always say with people, we were kind of brainwashed into thinking you have to eat high carb and low fat. And, you know, if you don't have your energy gels or your sport drink during your, your trainings, every single training session, you're not going to, you're not going to do well, you're going to fail. So I started just looking 
looking around, poking around a little bit, and, and noticed a lot of the athletes who I was helping as a sport dietitian were also having GI distress. And I was finding that huge correlation. You know, I look at their dietary logs and I looked at what I was eating, and we all had the same thing happening. So I, I kind of went back to science and you know looked at uh, looked at some physiology, some biochemistry, some nutrition again, and kind of what I what I studied but kind of forgot about in my undergrad and graduate degree, and and thought, huh, the body stores you know probably close to 80,000 calories of fat and mm-hmm. only between about 1,400, 1,800 calories is carbohydrate. And I was thinking to myself, if there's a way where we can actually teach our body to use more fat, perhaps we could decrease the amount of carbohydrates we eat during exercise because that usually predisposes us for GI distress. And that's why I was getting a lot of my GI distress because you know, I was pounding the sport drinks and the energy gels and just like everybody was telling me to do, right? So oh, yeah. I, I explored yeah, I explored it and, and found out, you know, obviously um, there was an aerobic component to, to burning fat, aerobic exercise, but I wanted to go beyond that because I knew just training aerobically, at least for, for me as an athlete, that's not going to help me achieve my performance goal because I need to do threshold training, VO2 max training. Mm-hmm. So I looked into it a little bit more and, and just and realized that just by by the simple act of controlling blood sugar with real food, and that's you know I'm talking breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, just by controlling your blood sugar, you could actually teach your body to burn more fat. And, and I had wondered back then, this was in 2004, I had mm-hmm. wondered why hasn't anybody told me this before, right? Why why haven't the, the, the sport dietitians who've been doing this for decades why haven't they been talking about this, right? So, yeah. I, again, you know, I got my guinea pigs, me, myself, and uh, a couple of my athletes, and I just started changing their daily nutrition. And the first thing I noticed, Aaron, was no GI distress on long training runs, long training rides. Then we took it into competition, and they would come back saying, no GI distress, no throwing up, no vomiting, no diarrhea, no nothing. Yeah. And that is where the, the proverbial, you know, light bulb went off, and I said, something has just begun. And, and you know, this whole metabolic deficiency, I I, I Term the concept metabolic efficiency because mm-hmm. in the athletic and the coach world we are so focused on improving efficiency of biomechanics that I thought it made sense to to to, to bring that word efficiency into the nutrition world mm-hmm. and hence the name metabolic efficiency. How efficient can you make your body at using fat and preserving carbohydrates? Mm-hmm. So that was that was a short history. Yeah, Bob, that's a great story. How you talk about those stomach issues? You know, I suffered with that for years and I couldn't figure it mm-hmm. out. And, and uh, you know, after switching to a paleo style diet, those totally went away. And I think it was because of, I didn't have to take in as much fuel during my runs. I, I just didn't exactly. feel like I needed it. And that's um, exactly it. How it, can you actually measure the amount of fat that someone is burning during the day and during exercise and then figure out yeah. how much they need? I mean, talk to us a little oh, yeah. about, about how that works. Yeah. So this, you know, with, with, so I developed this concept of metabolic efficiency um, and, you know, training through nutrition. And then I thought, well, I'm an exercise physiologist. I've got a metabolic, uh, metabolic heart. I do VO2 max testing, all this type of testing. And I was, I was thinking to myself, is there a way to measure, you know, the, the amount of fat we burn and, and all this stuff? And how can I put this all together? And, and, it, and it dawned on me. I'm like, well, I've got the technology sitting here. So I developed the test. To, to give us that exact information. So it's, you know, efficiently called metabolic efficiency testing, but it's actually a very simple, simple test for athletes because unlike a, a VO2 max test where you're running on a treadmill or, or biking on a bike with, with a mouthpiece or a face mask in, um, it, it, it does not require high intensity exercise because in fact, a lot of athletes do not have metabolic efficiency points. And what that point means is basically that cross where your body prefers to use more carbohydrate versus fat. So what I do is I test at a very sub-maximal level. Very, I mean, you you would run at a ridiculously slow pace on the treadmill, and and the intensity does increase. I increase about every five minutes, and I basically look for that point in the body where you're, it shifts from fat burning to sugar burning, carbohydrate burning. Okay. And once I know that point, I can set the entire not only an exercise program, but I can detail a, a daily nutrition plan that supports that person's metabolic efficiency at that given time because it changes much like lactate threshold changes throughout the year based on training metabolic efficiency also changes based on nutrition changes and, and training changes okay. so really really simple test to do and I, I believe that test is basically measuring how much carbon dioxide you're expiring and that the amount of that will tell you how much fat you're burning is that correct yeah okay. yeah so the the technical is, is basically the the metabolic cart looks at how much oxygen you're consuming for 
versus carbon dioxide you're producing, okay. that ratio is called the respiratory exchange ratio. Um, and not to get too technical, but that respiratory exchange ratio will tells you tells you the amount of fat or carbohydrate that you're burning throughout different intensities of exercise. So that that's the beauty of it, because I can find at what pace or heart rate you are most metabolically efficient and least metabolically efficient, and I can prescribe training for you that is just spot on. And, and like I said, more importantly, I can I can suggest dietary changes that will improve that. Okay, so you just mentioned there that more importantly, it's actually the diet, not the training. Um, yeah. How much, how much can you actually <clears throat> Excuse me. How much can yeah. you actually affect that RER or that respiratory exchange rate by just yeah. changing your diet? I mean, what have you seen in the lab? Oh, it's it's amazing. And, and athlete after athlete that I kind of put through the ringer and do some testing and change their nutrition. And and I've held some athletes training very consistent, so no, you know, all aerobic kind of a thing. And I've only changed their dietary habits. I have found so far to date about 75% of the opportunity to, to burn more fat comes from your nutrition program versus 25% from just aerobic, you know, kind of that zone one, zone two training. So a lot more profound changes from changing your daily nutrition. And, you know, and that's, I, I, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, a real food as much as possible sport dietitian. That's the beauty of this because, you know, I look at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks, and you think about even if you're eating three, four times a day, that's three or four opportunities to optimize blood sugar to teach your body to burn fat whereas maybe if you're lucky you know some people these days they don't even they don't even run once a day anymore right they, yeah. maybe it's every other day so you have far less opportunities from an exercise training perspective to develop your fat burning versus eating three to four times a day to affect it from a nutrition standpoint right you know can you go into the diet a little is it is it a low carb diet or what exactly yeah. does it involve great question yeah great question so what I've also been finding and, and it's developing, you know, much like the paleo diet has developed over the past few years, this metabolic efficiency is also developing. And um, to, the, the grounded uh, take-home message for metabolic efficiency, like I said earlier, is control and optimize blood sugar. We know that we can do that if you combine protein, fat, and fiber uh, through food, obviously, throughout the day. And I look for, I, I kind of think on carbohydrate and protein together, right? The fiber is carbohydrate. If you can eat a ratio of a one-to-one carbohydrate to protein, then you will balance your blood sugar very well. And we know that from, from a lot of diabetes research, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, this is where metabolic efficiency started, was just saying, eat eat the same amount of protein that you would carbohydrate, and usually fruits and veggies are my first choice. If you if you eat the same amount, you're going to balance blood sugar. But, okay. it, it, so that's the standard, right? That's the, that's the, the foundation. But I've been playing with this low-carb, high-fat option in developing metabolic efficiency in the past about eight months mm -hmm. and I have noticed there is so so much more significant effect of developing your body's ability to burn fat by following a low carb high fat in fact you can do it much quicker and you can sustain it right, right. because obviously you know it sustains hunger it improves satiety but I've also this is the beauty of it so I've done metabolic efficiency testing on my low carb high fat athletes but I've also done blood work testing and I found that once I and you probably heard this before from a lot of your speakers on the on the podcast but mm -hmm. I have turned you know people with hyperinsulinemia, hypercholesterolemia, just poor blood lipids, you know, maybe pre-diabetic state, I've reversed those on a high-fat, low-carb diet. And that, that that makes sense to us now. You know, we're actually changing the way uh, we look at nutrition, uh, at least some of our forward thinkers, I call them, in the industry, because fat isn't isn't our enemy. Fat is actually right. our friend. It's those refined sugars and you know, all the processed carbohydrates that, that's our enemy. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what has that been like telling your athletes that? Are they still fat phobic? Are they scared about fat? <laughs> yeah. I mean, do they think you're going to yeah. uh, clog their arteries? Pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. You know, some, some of them, you know, when I start introducing bacon, butter, they're like, you know, I, I would say about 10% of them rejoice and they just, they're celebrating, right? And the other 90% are like, wait a second, you know? And, and, you know, I think it helps coming from me because I, I was classically trained in, in exercises and nutrition and, and I was taught, you know, the, the standard high carb, low that diet for athletes and, you know, pushing carbs. So it, it's easier when it comes from me because I say, I've been there. I've not only been educated on that, but I've also done that and made that mistake in my athletic career. And, and so I kind of developed that trust a little bit more with the athletes because, you know, I follow a, a what I call a controlled carbohydrate, higher fat diet now. And I'll cycle my 
carbohydrates based on my training and based on the sports that I'm doing. But I think it's more well-received coming from me now because I actually do practice what I preach and, and I am my own guinea pig. So I can tell them, listen, I had a problem with it at first too. I looked at the research. I looked at the findings. I did the, the case study on myself, you know, and I'm, I, I have a lot of, uh, um, unfortunately, bad genetic cards that have been dealt with me in terms of blood lipids and disease based in my family. So I said, hey, if I can follow, you know, 60% more of my calories as fat and turn around my blood lipids and decrease my, my state of, of disease risk and improve my performance at the same time, pretty sure it will work for you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So yeah. how long does it take for someone to adapt to a higher fat style diet? If this was something that a listener wants to try, what's yeah. the time frame here? Yeah, I think the ver- like if you look at the research, the verdict is still out. We're not quite sure how long it takes to completely adapt. I will tell you in my practice, though, I can take I can take a, a, a person who will, and I say this tongue in cheek, but who will actually listen to me, right? So who will implement the dietary changes? I've found about two to four weeks because that's about the time it takes to change a behavior. And, and when we make nutrition changes, it's really about changing our behavior from one to, to the next. So you give it two to four weeks, absolutely no problem. You know, And usually that first week is all about figuring out what food to eat. And you know, like with myself, I had, a, I had a really easy time decreasing carbohydrates in my diet, but I had a tough time increasing the fats. And that's, mm. that's kind of what, what my sticking point was because I was so hungry all the time because I simply wasn't increasing my fats enough. So, you know, I usually give it a couple of weeks just to kind of figure out the nuts and bolts of, of how to actually do it correctly. Right. And yeah. how long will it, how long will it take to figure out how much, say, um, a lot of listeners are endurance athletes and they're wondering how much to eat out on the course. And since yeah. you're fat adapted, you're actually consuming the fat that's on your body. So how do you exactly. figure out how much to eat when you're out there? That's a, that's a great question. You can, you can do quantitative or qualitative. So quantitative, you kind of go back to the metabolic efficiency testing, like I talked about, um, um, just just by doing one of these tests, I can I can write you a prescription exactly how many calories per hour you need based on your metabolic efficiency state. So that's the quantitative. A lot of people don't have access to this testing based on where they live and based on these performance centers, maybe not doing the testing. So the qualitative is this. I usually, um, you know, it depends on where they start, right? I've taken a lot of like Ironman athletes who consume, you know, 400 calories an hour, just ridiculous amount. Um, and I have to kind of set them down a little bit slower because we don't want to shock their system too much. But, but here's what I start with. I tell, I tell athletes, once you are engaged in this metabolic efficiency dietary plan um, for a couple weeks, you know, that two to four weeks, start to decrease your hourly calorie intake during exercise by 25 to 50% right off the bat. So if you're, if you're normally consuming, you know, 200 calories per hour, Start by consuming 100 to 100, to 100 or, or go. The next step is to consume 100 to 150 calories per hour. And, and then just note the performance differences, right? Note your GI distress level, your GI comfort level. I will tell you this. My sweet spot for when a, a person is completely adapted and metabolically efficient, they will consume between 40 and 120 calories per hour, no matter of the distance race and no right. matter of the mode. It could be running, could be cycling, could be triathlon, absolutely. Yep. And does it matter? what kind of calories they're consuming i've heard some people try nut butters or coconut oil yeah, uh, yeah. for starch what's your what's yeah. your recommendation yeah you know my first recommendation is it has to be gi tolerable right so so and, and we call that gi safe too so i found that everybody is so different in their tolerance of different types of foods um and you know it depends on, the, on their on their you know if we just talk about runners are they an ultra runner or are they a 5k or 10k because obviously there's an intensity difference um that may actually predispose maybe having less fats or more fats, right, during mm-hmm. exercise because of that intensity. So I see a lot of my ultra runners, they're able to do more solid food, more a little bit more fat if they, you know, for I'm talking like the 24 hours and above races, um, whereas my short course athlete, you know, they actually consume things more like that super starch, the generation you can because they find that with the, with the high molecular weight, it gets out of the stomach quick. Uh, it is still carbohydrate and no fat, but they find that that's what works for their system based on the shorter distance and the more intensive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah. have you seen any athletes that have actually improved their performance or lost weight? You know, I, I had Tim uh, on the program yesterday and he said when he yeah. tried a lower carb diet, his running just came back and, and it was just amazing to him. Has that happened with any yeah. Every single athlete I work with uh, has a change in body weight slash body composition. Uh, kind of depends on where their body weight starts because sometimes the body weight doesn't change a lot, but body composition in terms of reducing fat mass changes significantly. 
But what I've noticed also is not only is performance increasing by, by note of their quantitative uh, performance, you know, finish time um, and, and decreasing their calories per hour, but their recovery is improved. And that's, mm. and I'm, I'm also an endurance coach and I care about recovery quite a bit because if my athletes are not bouncing back from workouts, they can't do tomorrow's or the next day's workout. So I've noticed this, this a little, you know, higher fat controlled carbohydrate nutrition plan promoting metabolic efficiency actually responds very well in recovery and, and if you really think about the whole concept of it, it it makes total sense right if you're teaching your body to burn more fat before going out for a run then you go out for a run and you're burning more fat what you're doing to carbohydrates is actually you're preserving them so after the run you actually end up with more carbohydrate stores than you would if you were a high carb diet guy or girl okay. right? so your recovery is actually quite quick because mm-hmm. you don't have to dump all those carbs in your body after exercise anymore Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, I mean, from some success stories, really quick, I, 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 a lot of my athletes did bad water this year and, and, you know, I paced her and she just crushed her age group record um, of 47 hours. She did 44 hours, 60 wow. years old, right? Wow. And did it on 80 calories per hour. Oh my god! Eighty calories. Yeah. What, what was she taking? I, I, at, what what kind of calories was she yeah, taking? Mostly, I would say about eighty percent generation you can, and then the other twenty percent just um you know towards the end of the race, whatever we could get in her body. You know, sometimes it was her her go to her well not her go to, but she really uh, liked things like crackers and jam for some reason in the in the cooler parts of the day. Um, my my uh, my go to because I was one of her pacers also, and we did this. She did the Brazil one thirty five last January or this January also. So uh, my saving grace, whenever I pace an ultra runner, I'll always have my emergency pack with me and included in there are, dare I say this, snicker bars. <laughs> and during certain times, uh, that's kind of my emergency go-to. Thing. It's not my standard, but it's uh, in times where you cannot and do not feel like eating anything or consuming anything, that's kind of my go-to. Okay. Um, yeah. So another another quick one, I, I worked with a professional Ironman athlete. He did his, um, he did Ironman Sweden this year. A little bit different sport, obviously, than running, but Ironman Sweden. He had never uh, really had uh, a, an Ironman race that was really a good PR race, right? So he PR'd this. He did an eight-hour and 59-minute Ironman place. He placed 10th place among the pros. But this is this is the thing. He used all generation you can, and he consumed 83 calories per hour. Wow. And I will tell you this. In professional Ironman world, that is unheard of because the intensity is obviously higher than a lot of our marathoners or even our ultra marathoners. So okay. unheard of what we can actually do by teaching the body to burn more fat. So do you happen to know what that guy's uh, RER was? Oh, I don't because we didn't. You know, I did I did his testing. Um, his, we didn't do his resting, but we found that we did his testing when you visited me early in the spring. Um, it was uh, it wasn't the greatest. Let's put it that way. That's where I started my pretty pretty in depth nutrition intervention to make him more metabolically efficient. Okay, so yeah. you mentioned and, and that's what. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna say that's what the test can tell you too. Is, is I I do a lot of tests on athletes and just to help them determine are they following the right nutrition plan, right? Because okay. because Sometimes they think, well, yeah, I'm doing it right. But then, you know, you get the numbers back and you're like, well, actually, no, there's still room for improvement here. Mm, okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that this will work for longer races. What if someone's trying to set a PR in the 5K or 10K? Does yeah. Do you think that this yeah. will still work? Oh, it works phenomenally. And I actually get a lot of pushback from athletes and coaches saying, I'm short course, I'm fast, I'm high intensity. You know, it's, it's all about carbohydrates. And I say, well, when you factor in, and it depends on their level, but when you factor in what is necessary for a PR at short course, uh, body weight and body fat are factors, right? Because right. obviously the low, and I, I'm not trying to, trying to really, uh, place emphasis on the lightest possible body weight, but we know that if you get to a little bit lighter racing weight, that you can achieve a PR much easier. So this metabolic efficiency, teaching your body to burn more fat, makes sense because you will see a little bit of weight loss and more significant body composition loss, which which preludes and supports PRs at shorter course distances. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Now, in, yeah. and especially in the short races, you're really not burning that many calories, maybe yeah. 300 to 600. Uh, exactly. So, you probably don't need a ton of carbs anyways. No, I mean, even even my marathoners, like most of my marathoners, if they're, you know, between 315, 345, they, they consume no calories at all. 
Absolutely okay. none. Really? Yeah, and especially, yeah, our, our five tiers, ten tiers, you know, they don't need any calories. They just, they need to make sure they kind of prime the pump beforehand. You know, they're a little bit hydrated, and they just go out and have a great effort. Because, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning, the last thing you want are stomach issues, at, especially those higher intensities, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Bob, what do you think about the paleo diet? I, well, here's an interesting little tie with that. The creator of the paleo diet, Dr. Cordain, was my exercise physiology professor in my undergraduate work at Colorado State University. Oh, so wow. back back in the days, he was uh, he was exercise physiology professor, great great professor, great guy. Um, you know, I had I like many registered dietitians had my doubts when it came out. Uh, then I read it and I said, you know what? This is talking about the concept, really, of controlling blood sugar. A lot of this makes sense, you know, whether whether or not the the research and the data from from millions of years ago is, or thousands of years ago is, is correct or not. I didn't care about that, but I said the foundational concept is is really justified here. Um, I, there's a lot of spinoff I've been seeing on paleo diet, um, but I think the the overall concept. I, I think it's, it's difficult to follow a diet, but I think if you call it the paleo way of eating, and because there are a few manipulations here and there. I think a lot of it is, is grounded in terms of what we're trying to do with controlling blood sugar. I just from from a practical standpoint as a sports dietitian, a lot of athletes come to me saying I can't follow it because it's so restrictive or it's not fitting my lifestyle, and that's that's where I come in and I help them and I say, okay, let's let's make this fit your lifestyle. But at the end of the day, you know, paleo supports blood sugar control very well. Okay, so give me yeah. an example of uh, something that you would eat on a typical day that would would yeah. be you know this kind of diet, the higher fat diet. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, listening to my hunger, and I create a lot of pretty high satiety through the foods I eat. So I always start with a morning smoothie, and, and I make it for my uh, my entire family, three kids and, and my wife. So uh, I always start with I put a little bit of water in the blender, and, and these choices will change based on my palate uh, and my taste preferences. But I'll, I'll use some unsweetened coconut milk. I'll put coconut oil in there, usually about, you know, two, three, four tablespoons, depending on what my smoothie uh, taste buds are calling for. Um, I'll usually, like this morning, I did kale and spinach. What else did I put in there? Kale and spinach. Then I'll do some unsweetened, uh, just shredded coconut in there. I'm a big fan of coconut for many reasons. Uh, and then I will put some whey protein powder in there. And this morning was, was a chocolate flavor. Uh, put some ice in there, blend it up. Boom. That's my very good balance of protein and very little carb. You know, obviously a little bit from the spinach and the kale uh, and a little bit from the coconut and the coconut milk. But very, very little. That'll keep me full for about three, three and a half hours. And then throughout, you know, I'll snack on some raw almonds. Um, one of my favorite lunches that I just I just adore right now at least are just throwing some turkey and some cheese and, and some, uh, some mayonnaise in a in a in a wrap a iceberg lettuce wrap mm-hmm. that's that's usually my lunch and and this is this is during training too right so I did some run sprints yesterday and you know my, for me right now it doesn't matter what my training is my my daily eating stays pretty 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 similar right to support that uh, last night was uh, made a pot roast and what did I have with that pot roast and I had just a little small serving of sweet potatoes with a copious amount of butter and cream in it. Mm-hmm. And that's you no know, cheese, uh, snack on quite a bit of cheese throughout the day. But that's, that, I have to tell you, Aaron, I mean, me, you know, a few years ago on my high carbohydrate diet, I would just over consume, you know, energy bars and trail <laughs> mix. And I mean, you know, oatmeal, I mean, I had this oatmeal concoction that was probably, you know, over 100 grams of carbohydrate on its own, right? Uh-huh. And what I, what I found in eating a little bit higher fat controlled carbohydrate is my daily eating choices are so simple because one, I don't eat as much because obviously the hunger response is so nice and the satiety is so high. But two, I don't feel like I have sugar cravings anymore. I don't feel like I need to seek all those things out. Now, I enjoy my occasional, you know, daily piece of dark chocolate, which, you know, is just, it's just, it's just my, my vice, right? Um, you know, usually try to get 70% or more from the dark cocoa. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've just found like many of my athletes that eating becomes so much easier because mm-hmm. you're so much fuller. And, you know, I, I, I don't switch things up a bit, you know, quite a bit. You know, dinner time is, is usually when we try to experiment, but usually for breakfast and snack and lunch, it's pretty similar day after day. Okay. Yeah that, yeah, that ability to go between meals without snacking. I used to be a huge snacker. I would always have to carry a cliff bar or some yep. snacks with me. You know, every yep. couple hours, I'd be hungry again. But yeah, yeah. Being, you know, being able to just go between meals without snacking or being hungry is great. It's what very about, liberating, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what about calories? Um, do you advise counting calories? Is that something that people need to do? 
You know, when I was classically trained as a registered dietitian coming out of my clinical internship, that's what I was taught, so that's what I thought we had to do. It took me about a year to figure out that that was not right for athletes. I am. I do not. I do not promote calorie counting whatsoever. You know, if we want to get into the counting, um, sometimes I'll start my athletes on counting the grams of carbohydrates just to make sure we're controlling them. But but I try to teach more from the hunger and the satiety signals rather than total calories of food. And and when we follow a controlled carbohydrate higher fat diet, as long as you can listen to your body, you don't need to count any numbers at all because your body will not lead you astray as long as you're listening to it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Great. Well, so for someone who's 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 really interested, they're hearing this. Is this something that they need to do in the off season? I mean, you, you probably wouldn't want to try this before your next race. I'm guessing to, to just it, suddenly switch know, over. Yeah. The, the beauty of this is it can have very significant effects no matter when you try it. It's okay. just easier to implement it when you are not in a competition mode. And like I said, if if you even if you allow yourself two to four weeks to start making this nutrition behavior change, you'll be successful. But definitely don't. You know, if you've got a competition within six to eight weeks, don't think about changing your nutrition too much. Um, that said, I have worked with a couple of very, very analytical OCD type A athletes who can literally flip the switch in one day and change their nutrition habits, and they're fine. Really? So that's probably about yeah, that's probably about ten percent of the population. But there are some people out there that can just say, "I'm going to do it," and, and they're they're very successful with it. I I kind of like the slower approach because it promotes more of, more of a lifestyle change and more of a lifestyle adoption. Okay. Well, Bob, yeah. where can people go to find out more about you? and more about this metabolic efficiency. Yeah, they can go to my website, fuelformance, F-U-E-L, the number four, M-A-N-C-E.com. That's my sport nutrition consulting uh, company. And certainly you can just Google my name, Bob Sibahar, and you can come up with all my resources, articles are floating around the internet. I've got a lot of e-books. I've got obviously my metabolic efficiency training book. So a lot, of, a lot of great resources out there. Okay. Well, Bob, it's been great talking with you today. Thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate it.